and welcome to According to Pete. Uh, the questions are rolling in. Um, most of the questions I have no idea how to answer right off the top of my head, but that's the cool thing about being an engineer. They don't teach you all the answers to all the questions, they teach you how to find the answers to all the questions. Don't be afraid of not knowing something, just jump in, go look it up, and you're golden. Okay, so there's two things I want to do today. I want to answer one of the questions that we've received directly. And uh, the second is I want to introduce uh, a project idea I have. The idea is that um, if I can do a project from, from conception to completion, that I can answer a whole bunch of different questions in context, okay? Um, but we'll talk about that more at the end. So the first question I want to attack is uh, one about capacitors that we got. What kind of capacitor do you choose? What sort of value do you choose for an application? What sort of chemistries are there? Um, those are big questions and there's a lot of information there. I'm going to be shortcutting like a mad dog through this, so let's hit the board. So let's talk about what a capacitor is. In essence, a cap is just two plates that are in very close proximity to each other that you have a voltage across, okay? Now, these two plates are separate. They can be separated by uh, a lot of different materials, but we'll get into that in a second. What's this good for? Um, well, this thing passes an AC current, but it won't pass a DC current. So something that you could use this for, um, for example, is to filter noise off of a voltage regulator circuit. You can also use it to couple uh, AC signals from one amplifier stage to another where you don't want DC to go through. Now, there's a lot of different chemistries behind these, okay? There's electrolytics, there are tantalums, there are ceramics, there's lots of different kinds. Uh, why? Well, let's look at the construction for a sec. Now, capacitance as a value is um, directly proportional to the physical size of these plates, right? The bigger the plates are, the more capacitance you get. And what that effectively means is the more charge you can store here, the more electrons that you can get going in and out, right? Now, it's also inversely proportional to the distance between the plates, all right? So the closer you can make these things, the more capacitance you get, right? So ideally, what you wanna do is have really huge plates being really, really close together. The problem is that the closer you make these plates to each other, the more likely it is that this is going to break down and arc across, and then you got a short. So in order to get the most bang for your buck out of your capacitor, what a cap manufacturer will do is they'll put a material between the two plates called a dielectric, okay? Uh, and that lets them get the plates really, really close together without um, allowing the part to go bang. Bang! Now, different dielectrics have their own sets of problems associated with them. Uh, one is leakage current, okay? There will actually be a DC current, very small one, but a DC current that will go through this part. Um, you've also got something called ESR, or equivalent series resistance, and we're gonna talk about that in a little bit here. So, all that clear? No, it's not, is it? Okay, well, now that I've ballparked it into oblivion, let's uh, look at a couple of examples that we have around here. So the first example I wanna do is a power supply. So for example, let's say that we've got our standard LM317, all right, here's your VN at some voltage, and you have a couple of resistors here that set up the output, and what you'll see at the end of these, in most of our designs, is probably a large capacitor that's probably a tantalum, okay, uh, or electrolytic, and I'll explain the chemistries like that we choose in a bit, um, probably in the neighborhood of 10 microfarad. And then what you might see is a little one. And this will be a little ceramic, like an 0603 package, right? In the neighborhood of 0.1 microfarad, all right? And I apologize if this seems a little convoluted to start with. Bear with me, this is all gonna make sense by the end. So what's going on here? Well, you remember that I was saying uh, a cap will pass an AC current just fine, but it will not pass a DC current. So what I'm doing is at the output of this voltage regulator, I'm actually coupling the AC signal that may be present here to ground, right? So it doesn't get out to my other stuff, right? Now where's that noise coming from? Well, uh, it could be, for example, a switching power supply on the input of this regulator, and maybe this regulator isn't good enough to handle the noise, right? Switching power supplies make all kinds of high-frequency junk. Uh, also, you may have something out here farther in the circuit 
that uh, has sporadic current requirements, like uh, a cell module. GM862s are notorious for this. Um, and these will help sort of smooth out that action. Uh, little note about voltage ratings on caps, for example, in this circuit. Uh, if I'm driving, um, for example, a GM862, I might have this set at 4.0 volt, give or take. Um, I would nominally like to see these two voltage ratings to be at least twice that. All right. If it's not, you can start getting into problems with the lifespan of the part. Now, this isn't really that big of a deal because this part is probably already going to be 16 volts. That's just fine. This part, probably 50 volts. So, if you get into higher voltages, um, a, a factor of two rule of thumb is a real good thing to go by. So around here we, we use a lot of uh, electrolytic caps, we use a lot of tantalum caps, sometimes interchangeably, uh, and we use a lot of ceramic caps, right? But, but why these and why in the combination that you saw in the power supply example? These are what I would call garden variety caps, all right? They're, they're relatively cheap, they have good capacitance values, and they're readily available. You can get them anywhere. These are the different cap types that we typically use around here. These two guys are electrolytic. This one is typically what you will see in an electrolytic cap. It's a through hole component, right? Now for our processes, we'll go with something like this. This is a surface mount electrolytic capacitor. Um, doesn't lend itself well to doing by hand, as you can see. I have done it, but it's not pretty. Electrolytic caps are good for large capacitance values, and they tend to be pretty cheap. Um, but they are kind of bulky, and they're not great with ESR. This guy, that's a tantalum capacitor. Uh, it's smaller than electrolytic. Uh, it has good capacitance values. Tends to be a little bit more expensive, um, and it's not the greatest with ESR either. Okay, but it's an alternative. Now these guys, can you see those? Those are teeny. These are 0603 ceramic caps, uh, values of 0.1 microfarad. Now they're very small uh, capacitance values, but they're really good with ESR, and they're really teeny. So you can put them in a, uh, on a service mount board, and it's cake. We love these things. So we keep talking about ESR. ESR, ESR, ESR. Why do we care? Well, let me show you what ESR really is. Remember this guy, right? Our old friend the capacitor. He's awesome. This thing in the real world does not truly exist. Bear with me. This is what we really have. That guy. Equivalent series resistance. Now again, why do we care? Draw you another picture. Remember that the transfer function of this thing, right? If this is time, t equals zero. We got time going yay. And this is voltage, voltage and or current, and it'll become clear-ish. At t equals zero, when, the, when a transient hits this cap and it demands the cap actually does something about it, it takes a finite period of time for this cap to reach what we would call equilibrium, okay? And it's got something to do with that guy right there. Remember, at the same time that voltage is doing this, current is doing this. At t equals zero, voltage is at minimum, current is at maximum. And it does not take a very large value of that resistance for it to start interfering in the time it takes for this thing to react. So what we typically do, right, I showed you this diagram a little bit ago, on the output of a power supply, we'll say this is that line again, is we will put, like I showed you before, um, one of these, like one of these uh, either electrolytic or tantalum, paired with a ceramic, a small value ceramic, okay? Now what's going on here is that at t equals zero, this guy can't react fast enough to the high frequencies, right? That's where those are going to occur. So the idea is that this guy reacts much more quickly, and he's going to fill in the gap before this guy is actually able to come on and, and do its thing, okay? So between the two of them, we get better decoupling performance. For our second example, uh, suppose that you want to make an audio amplifier with a couple of stages of op amps, all right? So I'm just gonna shortcut this, because I shortcut everything. And we'll say this is an op amp stage and you got a gain of times 10, and you want another op amp stage here with another gain of times 10. And let's say that you are running these things from five volts. 
right? So you got a single pole supply and you want to bias this thing, right? To get the right output here, you need to bias these guys at half of VCC or half of five volts, okay? So you're gonna have a reference in here of like 2.5 volts. If you've got your reference at two and a half volts here, and these two are DC coupled, let's say you've got an offset between your signal input to your output, right? If I've got no signal coming in here at all, and this thing is just sitting quiescent, and let's say that instead of 2.5 volts, you've actually got 2.6 volts out here, okay? Now check this action out. If you've got this DC couple and this is times 10, you've got 0.1 volts offset here. Out here, you're gonna have 10 times that, okay? So this guy is gonna be sitting at like, I think 1.6 volts. Well, that's gonna jack up your AC signal dramatically, isn't it? So what you would do is split that guy right bar, okay? That's a cap. It's gonna pass AC signal just fine. Now, one of the things, actually, the, the biggest thing that you're gonna to wanna to concern yourself with here is that to calculate that cap value, you have to take into consideration the input impedance of this stage. Now, to bias this thing properly for gain and, and your reference and such, you're gonna have some other resistors here that are gonna determine what your input impedance is, okay? Now, to make sure that this doesn't cut off your frequencies of interest, you need to make sure that the impedance of this sucker is like a tenth, and this is a rule of thumb, one tenth of what the input impedance of this stage is, all right? And there's an equation to go with this. Uh, and it is X sub C, which is capacitive reactance, and it's in ohms, equals one over two pi F C, where F is the frequency of interest, and C is the value of capacitance, okay? If you know what the input impedance of this stage is, um, you take one tenth of it and you plug it in here and then you solve for capacitance at the lowest frequency of interest. And this is really only to illustrate that you can use this to couple a signal from one stage to another and block DC, right? This goes away. It's magic. Oh my gosh. And then you get your 2.5 volts reference on the output instead. So that wraps up my description of some of the cap types that we tend to use around SparkFun. There's a lot of different chemistries that you could be using depending on your application, and you really have to know your application pretty well to know if you need some of those other cap types. You probably can't go wrong playing with different caps as long as you adhere to things like voltage ratings and you don't over voltage them. Capacitors will typically uh, blow up bang, uh, if you over voltage them. The electrolytics and the tantalums, if you over voltage them or reverse polarity them, oh my god, they go big. If you want to check out more information on capacitors, check out Wikipedia there's a ton of information on that stuff and you better believe I checked it out before I did this last thing I want to talk about is uh, my project idea uh, I get lots of questions about um, small bits how do you start how do you you know how, how do you put things together so it seems to me that it would be a cool thing if I were to just do a project from start to finish okay and, and you could all watch like all the stuff I go through to get something from idea to completion. So to start a project, the first thing you need, the very first thing, is an idea. So I got an idea. I'm, I'm building a workspace in my garage, okay? I need some music. And I could just use an old boombox, but where, where's the fun in that? So what I think I want to do is I want to start with uh, the STA 540 amplifier kit that we sell, um, and I want to add some junk to it to make it cool like our spectrum analyzer shield, and then make, maybe set up some, some, some graphic action, right? So I can see that. Maybe some VU meters. So I'm gonna have like the spectrum analysis going, and I'll have a VMU meter going like this for each channel. Then I got these things. We're gonna start sourcing these things. This is a 10K automated fader. It's a stereo fader too, check that. That's a motor, awesome, full of awesome. This thing rocks. And then to top it all off, I'm thinking I want to automate the whole thing to be able to uh, run it from my phone. So it sounds like uh, maybe an X2 gateway and an XB. To be honest, you know what? I'm, I'm making this all up on the fly. I don't know what the interfaces are that I'm going to have to deal with yet. I don't know what my current requirements are. I don't even have anything on paper. 
okay? I'm making this all up as I go. I might crash and burn, I might actually make it work. So um, if you have any feedback on that, uh, feel free to post it in the comment section and I'll be having a look at that. So that's it for this month. Thanks for watching. Uh, keep the questions coming. They're freakishly scary in some cases, and I can see I'm going to have to up my game dramatically. Uh, you can submit them to feedback at sparkfun.com with the uh, according to piece in the subject line, and they will forward that action to me. And until then, see you next month. <laughs>